Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Zikamai Bere, the National Director of the Zimbabwe Human Rights Association, Zim Rights. If you enjoy this conversation, remember to subscribe, to like, and share. Zikamai Bere, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure having you here. Tell me, am I right in assuming that now that the elections are over, Zim rights can relax? No, no way, no way. Um, Trevor, you may have been following a lot of the shenanigans happening with our elections, but what has become very clear is that we have been plunged into a perpetual state of elections. Mm. So there is no time to relax. What does that mean for the human rights situation? Perpetual atmosphere of election campaigning. What does that mean to you? Yeah, so, um, so a lot of things have been happening. Um, a lot of things have been happening. But the first point that I want to underline is that elections in our country mm. Um, have become a source of fear. You see, elections as part of the machinery that supports democracy are supposed to bring hope. They are supposed to bring good news, hope for ordinary people to participate. Mm. But the tragedy of our country is that every time an election date is announced, there is fear and trepidation. And where does that come from? It comes from a legacy of violence. Mm. Because over a number of years now, our elections have been known to deliver nothing more than bloodshed. As a result, we have documented um, and we have evidence that shows that each time we are approaching an election, the incidences of politically motivated violence, they go up. Um, in my previous position, when I was still uh, working with the National Transitional Justice Working Group, we carried out a study in which we published a report that is called Taking Transitional Justice to the People, a report that shaped the current constitutional provisions around transitional justice. And we spoke to more than 3,500 people. What do you feel when elections are coming? They are afraid when elections are coming because they are harrowing stories of political violence. So you tell us as human rights defenders that we, when elections are announced, it's bad news because mm. we know that it's going to trigger a lot of suffering in the communities. How do you, how do we cure that? How do we deal with that? Because uh, to come, I, I get a sense that whether opposition or ruling party, there's, they, we have, have we learned the, elex, the, the lessons rather from the fact that our oh, elections are violent, are violent. What do we do to ensure that these elections are violent? Have we, have we learned anything at all? All of us as a nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trevor, this is a very important reflection um, that you, you are inviting us to. And we have had several conversations in the run-up to the 2023 elections. And um, one of the things that we said in the run-up to the 2023 elections is that there is no realistic possibility of this election providing a free expression of the will of the people as embodied by our constitution. Now, that's an important observation Absolutely. that has not been disputed. In fact, it has been confirmed by the election audit that we did um, together with the Platform for Concerned Citizens hosted by uh, Service Trust, a number of dialogues that did confirm that the situation as it stands, there is no realistic possibility of it delivering the free will of the people. Now, when you come to that conclusion, the question is, where do we go yeah. from here? Now, this is where we have failed as a nation, one, to find consensus around what needs to be done. So you ask me, what do we need mm. to do? Mm. Um, so the, the, there are three levels of engagement. 
the first level of engagement, of course, where I come from, from civil society. Um, as Zim writes, you know, we are a grassroots movement, over 250,000 members across the country. And our key focus is bringing citizen voices into the conversation on human rights. Now, we need to be asking ourselves as civil society, are we still in touch with the communities that we are representing? Um, over a long period of time, over professionalization of civil society as led to what we call elite capture and led to the disconnect between civil society and the communities that they represent. Now, it is very important that we listen and put our hand on the pulse of the communities. And if the communities are saying these elections are delivering bloodshed to us, why do you let politicians proceed with them? So there is need for an alignment in civil society. There is, Trevor, we, we will say this without apologies, there is a very profitable election industry in this world. Billions of dollars go towards elections. No wonder why you find discord. And this is the time where we need to be speaking to ourselves as civil society. Are we just going to go through these elections and tick another box for the sake of another fancy report? Our view is we should be able to draw a line in the sand, find each other in civil society. What do the communities expect us to say to do and to provide leadership. And a lot of our members that we have been speaking to have been saying, why are we doing this? So we need that consensus at civil society level. Now, they say, well, before you go on, you're, you're people are saying, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's, that's, that's the people at grassroots. How do you answer them? Now, um, uh, part of the work that we have been doing, uh, Trevor, um, is around the People's Human Rights Manifesto. And it has been a response to that question. Because in these conversations, these are conversations that we took seriously in the year 2022, because we knew that 2023 is going to be an election. So we had some very deep conversations in which we identified three elements of a toxic political culture. Mm. One is the culture of violence. This is where you know, um, the Zimri strategy focuses on shifting power to the people. And we are looking at the power structure called elections. Who does it work for? So the community is divided that into three. So the first one being violence. And that when elections come, violence is deployed. So I spoke about that the situation did not allow for a realistic yeah. possibility. And one of the factors for that are the levels of violence. So violence is one of the cultures or the, uh, the pillars of the electoral culture in this country. So we had that conversation there. The second is the, is the, is the culture of bribery, mm. right? When elections come, politicians deliver goods. Um, so there is an overflow of seed and all those other goodies that come in. So that's a culture of bribery because if these things are coming every election, it means you're not getting to a point where the communities are fully empowered. So this isn't an empowerment gift, it's a disempowerment gift because every electoral period is coming back. So that's the second item. The third item is what we call cultism. Elections in our country are a beauty contest, not a contest of ideas, it's about who, not what. So when we then look at these three things, Communities said, how do we shift that power? So we then came, out, came, came about with the People's Human Rights Manifesto, in which communities said, we want to change, to try and change the flow of the conversation. Instead of the politicians coming to us, telling us what they think we want, we want to go to them with very clear key asks. So the People's Human Rights Manifesto, it articulates 10 key asks for the communities, which is why in the run-up to the 2023 elections on 12th April, we launched the People's Human Rights Manifesto. You may have heard one of the political parties saying, we don't need a manifesto, but the People's Human Rights Manifesto became the people's um, tool to shape the conversation that we are speaking about, so that we begin to shift those three pillars of power. First, there's a deep conversation around violence. If you then go through the manifesto, they said there are key demands around violence. Secondly, the issues of bribery. And then thirdly, I mentioned the issues of cultism. So when the communities tell us that 
Why are we doing this? We had that conversation and then we introduced the People's Human Rights Manifesto as a way of saying, politicians, civil society, let's reconnect with what the communities are saying and build an electoral dialogue based on those uh, 10 key asks. Wow. <laughs> this is big. It is. This is, this is daunting. It is. Um, you've said a couple of things that I want us to, 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 to revisit, which are, are worrying for me. One, the professionalization of civil mm -hmm. society. Um, speak to me about that. And, and as you speak to that, I want to inject uh, something perhaps that you, 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 you might push back against, which is I find that the professionalization of civil society has also gone hand in hand with the partisanship that's within the civil society. The civil society is no longer um, an uninterested party. They are taking a party in the, 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 the controversies that are taking place, the toxicity that is, take, is taking place. Talk to me about that, the professionalization and what I'm placing, which is that the civil society is, is, isn't partisan. It's taking a party. They are toxic. They are contributing to, to what has happened. Do you want to push back on that? So I can only speak um, from um, where I stand, from, from Zim Rights. Um, and this is an honest conversation that we have been having internally. Um, I, I've been um, with Zim Rights for um, over four years now, and um, I speak about this openly, our shifting power to the people's strategy. And perhaps a lot of people wonder where this conversation is coming from. It's because um, when we launched the shifting power to the people's strategy in March 2022, it's because Zim Rights was in trouble. Hmm. So you're looking at Zim Rights, which is Zimbabwe's first post-independence yeah, indigenous yeah. rights advocacy group. So we pioneered these conversations at a very indigenous level. But that means we also ran into some problems. You, you stepped on a few toes. Yes, because when you build a mass movement, other parties get interested. And their interest becomes the mobilizing power of, of Zim Rights. Rights. Now, um, so there, there, there are a lot of, 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 of you know, threads that we can tie to this, but I want to come back um, to, the, to, to the acknowledgement that there comes a time when we, be, we fell victim to what I call elite capture. Mm. Because once your mobilizing power becomes visible, it means a lot of money comes. But this isn't money that comes without strings. So the money comes saying, we want you to do election mobilization. So because of that, there became a time when I think um, the elections work overwhelmed the entire movement. So that's, that's one level mm. to then mm. say human rights are not only about elections. Mm. And, and in our new strategy, we have the eight actions on framework, which seeks to dismantle that imbalance of thinking human rights should just be about elections. There are people who, when they heard about some rights, only thought about election mobilization. So that's the first uh, uh, level of capture. The second level, you know, Zim rights is a grassroots movement. Um, a lot of people don't actually know that Zim rights is not an NGO, right? It's an association. So this is 250,000 people coming together saying we wanna drive human rights. But when they do that, in this context, they then thought we need to also start to resource mobilization. So they set up a professional secretariat to provide technical assistance. But now, so you do that um, and you bring in um, these educated young people with uh, these skills. And before you know it, they've got millions of dollars in their accounts. Mm. Now, as a member who is paying $1 per year, do you think you have power over no, those millions? No. So that then saw what I think is an unconscious shift of power to the secretariat over the membership. So that created a struggle. And the conversations that we had always been having when we were preparing the shifting power to the strategy was that we set up a secretariat not to take over, but to help us unlock the technical aspects. So part of the shifting power to the people's strategy is actually focusing on saying, how do we 
rebalance. So while we are secretariat, while we are professional, mm. while we, we've got some bit of knowledge, and this is a constant conversation that I'm having with my team, we are not Zemrites. So part of the shifting power to the people's strategy then it became um, what is um, strategic priority number, number three, transforming the Zimrites governance framework, which then brought in Zimrites original structures and found ways of strengthening them from the national structure mm. to the regional structures to the community structures mm. so that they shape the Zimrites agenda. So this is work that we, we have been trying to do. So that's the, 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 the second level. The third level, Trevor, is the shift to the power conversation, which is the big elephant when, when we're speaking about development assistance. Um, who's got the power when they give you the money? And this speaks about reconfiguring the relationship between uh, civil society and the donors. Mm. And underlining the foundation of that is this principle that the people who are in close proximity to the issues must have the power and determine how they want to move. So this is a conversation that we are having. So Trevor, you asked me, wow. I think from our own mm. perspective, these are the three aspects that we are dealing with. We're not denying them. Mm. And the shifting power to the people strategy mm. is trying to help us go through that introspection. And this, I think, I can't speak for other organizations, is an introspection which if civil society does not engage, civil society as we know it, will not exist in the next 10 years. Wow. <laughs> civil society, if we continue this way, civil society will not exist in the next 10 years. Those are your words. Very powerful. And, and they fit within my concern, very grave concern, that the toxicity that we have at the moment uh, on, on both sides of the aisle, our NGO civil society is contributing to that. Um, we'll take a break there, um, Zikamai. When we come back, uh, I want us to go to the issue that you raised, which is a big one, that elections are a profitable industry, <laughs> become a profitable center for some, for some people. But I also want you to ask you the question, Zikamai, why do you do this dangerous work? Um, of being a human rights defender. So viewers, don't go away. Join us after the break when we delve into those two big issues. See you on the other side. Every time we go to an election in this country, after the election, we cry and declare a crisis. <laughs> Welcome back to our conversation with uh, Zikamai Bere, the National Director of uh, the Zimbabwe Human Rights Association, Zim Rights. Before we went to the break, um, Zikamai, I was saying, let's, let's look at this issue that you placed on the table, that elections have become a profitable enterprise. And I recall just before the elections, I was involved in a debate um, with NGOs, um, a conversation that was that was called by Ibo Mandes. And we were trying to push guys, why are we holding the elections? Fascinating that in the room, the civil society, there was consensus that uh, we must have the elections because that's what the constitution says. But the constitution is our constitution. Mm -hmm. And if the elections are not delivering uh, what we want, we should revisit those things. I, mean, I know the church organization, some have said, let's have a sabbatical until we sort ourselves out. Talk to me about that, the fact that elections are now a profitable enterprise for civil society. Yeah, so it, it goes to the issue that I did mention, remember when I was saying we need to find each other. And I, I put that as level one of how we deal with this mm. problem of elections. Um, believe me, there are a lot of civil society groups that align with the very fact that really, w w when elections, and this is how you draw the line, here's the thing. Um, we need to look at the substance, what the constitution gives us. 
is an opportunity for people to express themselves. Yeah, yeah. So we are looking at the substantial value of those constitutional provisions. Now, my question is to both civil society leaders, political leaders, is if the if the calabash is broken, why do you pour milk mm, into it? Mm, mm. It's foolish. If the calabash is broken, you keep pouring milk into it, you are wasting resources, you are wasting people, because this calabash that we are talking about also delivers dead bodies, blood. So, so this is where we draw the line, uh, Trevor, to say, um, if we find each other in terms of the substantial value of those constitutional provisions, then we, it must be easy for us to say never again, mm -hmm. meaning to say we draw the line yeah. in the sand. So we, we had this conversation when we launched the first in the fear report, which we launched on the 22nd mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of August, just before the election, because we're trying to unpack the context. So we had this conversation. And when I made that, 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 uh, that, that, uh, uh, that comment, a, a good number of folks say, are you saying we should boycott elections? <laughs> No. And I said, no, boycotting an election is not participating in an electoral process without a plan, right? We are saying, let's engage, let's organize, and let's fix that which makes elections a formality, right? That's not doing nothing. And the response to that for us is tying, uh, tying the, 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 the threads at those three levels. So the first one, uh, I, I, I do not deny that there are colleagues who are pushed by profits. Profits, And part of the problem for that one is what I said, elite capture. So mm. if your international donor mm. is saying they've got mm. money, um, you can't tell them to go away with their money. So it means you're dancing to that tune and you're not putting the will of the people in there as a priority for your decision making. So that's the first thing. The second thing I mentioned about over-professionalization it's because I'm trained in writing a report and we say we're not going to be writing reports for the elections, I'm unemployed. So that, that, that becomes the, 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 the elite capture by professionals, what I call white collar civil society. Mm. And in each and every one of us, in each of our organizations, we find those forces and we have to constantly be pushing back. And my proposal now would be for us to find each other at that level because they're very authentic um, human rights activists that I've spoken to organizations that I've spoken to, we have a clear view of what elections are supposed to deliver. It's not another fancy report. It's the free will of, the, of people. the people. And if it does not have a mathematical possibility that this free will is going to see the light of the day, and you insist on it, why? Exactly. So that's the first level of that conversation. And there has, there has been work. There has been work mm. uh, that has been done. There is work that is ongoing around that area. So it's not hopeless. Mm. But the second level of it, Trevor, is the political alignment. You see, the, 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 the propaganda in this country has legitimized regime change as an illegal thing. As a result, a lot of civil society actors now hesitate engaging in substantial political conversations with our political leaders. I come from a different world. Political leaders are the primary duty bearers when it comes to realizing the, 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 the Bill of Rights in our constitution. So we can't sit back when a political leader, who you know has got an influence over the people, comes out against all the evidence and says, there is no way this election is gonna be stolen. <laughs> Where are you coming from? <laughs> So we disengage. As a result, that's that's the kind of 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 uh, of, of, of we, we've of figured out. We've figured out how they still, um, and we're going to make sure that it doesn't happen. But you look, you say, but that's not possible. Yes. You don't have the means. Yes. So the second level then becomes for us to say, okay, let's engage the political leaders who've got the influence, and you know, the People's Human Rights Manifesto was signed by five major political parties here in Zimbabwe, including the current president of Zimbabwe. Because we are making a statement mm. that you, 
as mm. political leaders. Mm. We will not let you run to hell with this country. You've got an obligation. You are the primary duty bearers. Mm. So let's have a conversation around the evidence. Hope is not a strategy. No. Right? So if the evidence tells us that we can't do this and achieve what the Constitution is expecting, how do we align politically? So that's the second level of political alignment. The third level then becomes the regional alignment. Mm. Because certainly I spoke about a lot of money going into yeah, the election. Yeah. So there are a lot of regional actors. So we've got the SADC that has issued a report. We've got the African Union. We've got the European Union. We've got Commonwealth. We've got all these are the regional actors. But the important thing is that if we reach a position that we are drawing a line in the sand, in civil society, maybe we are closer to the communities. Mm. And if we align this position with our political leaders so that nobody says things like, this election is not going to be stolen, and we have sold this uh, clearly with our international partners, then we are not going to have international partners who are going just to drive us through mm. a meaningless election. Mm. So this is a conversation that covers all these three levels. Mm. The, this issue of uh, elite capture of the civil society organizations, surely the uh, the voluntary PVO, mm. uh, public voluntary, that's what it's called, isn't yes, it? Yes, the PVO uh, bill. PVO bill. It, it brings, it justifies having the pure, pure PVO bill because uh, if we are going to have Donors sitting in Europe, in Europe, in America, determining the agenda where this elite has been captured to carry out a foreign agenda and not necessarily an agenda that says the people do not want elections. The people on the grassroots are saying, why are we having elections? But somebody who's got millions who is sitting in London or New York is saying, we should have elections. And Trevor, who is head of an NGO, says we should have elections because we're getting uh, millions. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Uh, Trevor, the PVO bill can never be justified. Uh, two wrongs don't make a right. Sure. Um, like I said, we, we have an honest introspection about the challenges that we face as civil society. And I believe that there are a lot of organizations, more of them are actually doing very good work and you have in place accountability mechanisms. I have been in many shift to the power conversations. Um, just in, uh, in December, I was in a room with over 700 activists holding the donors to account. So if you're going to speak to some of the donors, even in these countries, that in this country whom we have met with, they know that a lot of us are unapologetic mm. about where the power lies mm. and that we believe it's high time we begin to put those in close proximity to these issues in decision making. So this is an ongoing conversation, but it's not an issue of civil society or literature. Mm. This is an African liberation agenda. Mm -hmm. Even our governments, look at our parliament. They build Who's a funding nice, them? They build a nice yeah. parliament and they recall all the members of parliament. We're speaking about elections and it is the, an electoral process that is supposed mm. to give meaning to that parliament. So the issue of elite capture is not restricted to civil society. True. It's in every space, including the way that our governments operate. So when we then speak about shifting that power, it means we are having conversation around the power behind development assistance and how can we make it work for the ordinary people. Mm. So, so, we'll, we'll, let's leave the question of um, elections, but before we do that, should this not be the time where these tough conversations about why should we have another election in 2020? Is it 2028? Yeah. Um, why should we have another election if nothing has changed on yeah. the ground? If the masses are still saying, you invite us to get into this thing, but we don't see a change. I mean, look at where we are now mm -hmm. after the election that we, we've just had. Should we not, Tsikamai, be having these very tough conversations? Which by 2028, we're pretty clear, uh, let me say before 2028, two years time from now, to say we're pretty clear about what ought to be done and what not ought to, to, be, to be done. That the playing field is fair. Uh, 
all the matters that need to be addressed regarding free and fair elections and not subjecting the masses to bloodshed, mm -hmm. that all those things should not be done. Should we not be having those conversations now at a very accelerated pace? This, you're right, is the time. Um, and the three-level plan that I just shared with yeah. you is a summary of what actually is. But we actually call it the pre-mortem. We call it the pre-mortem. What does that mean? Every time we go to an election in this country, after the election, we cry and declare a crisis. <laughs> That's post-mortem. Mm. It doesn't help us. Mm. It's already done. So we, we invite in the three levels, stakeholder engagement, on what we're calling the pre-mortem. So we're saying before the crisis happens, that's where you declare the Absolutely. crisis. Absolutely. Before the crisis happens, that's where you draw a line in the sand. And it is our hope that we have said this before the elections. And it came out exactly, exactly. the way that we said it. Now, it's not a time for us to say we told, we told you, so, you so. But it's a time for us to say, can we avoid it? What lessons have we learned? What lessons have we learned from history? And how can we start to engage mm. now so that we come together to a people-centered electoral pact. Mm. What does it mean for elections? What is the value mm. of elections? In the next few weeks, we are going to be releasing a report that looks at the factors, or the mobilizing and sabotaging factors for civic engagement. Mm. Why should I, as the director of Zim Rights, go to the same communities that I encourage you to go and vote in 2023 tell them to go and do it again. Which brings me to the question, why are you doing this work? This is, this is not easy stuff, uh, Zikamai. You just had uh, uh, your two colleagues, um, the, the uh, Douglas Coltert and Tapiwa Mchineripi, who were facing charges. They are, they, are, they are human rights defenders. We're having lawyers being turned victims for simply standing up to represent their clients like Douglas Coltert and Takua Mchineripi. And I want to find from you, what is your why? Why do you do this work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Trevor, um, many times, you know, uh, if you read uh, uh, the story of Madiba, many times you find yourself way so deep without knowing it, but that's the pursuit um, of, uh, of justice. Um, so I have always been an activist uh, all of my life. I attend a number of meetings where, you know, people try to introduce me in other fancy ways, um, human rights lawyer, all those things. But at the end of the day, I have said I am an activist. Um, and activism, you don't find it, it finds you. Yeah, you, uh, activism finds you in the face of injustice when you then realize that you need to respond. And by the time you then look back while you are in a response mode, mm -hmm. you then realize you have covered a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. So my activism goes way back to the time when I was uh, still a student at Solusi University. And I was appointed to become the editor of a student magazine, magazine the Suva Varsity Post. My colleagues who I was with at that time know that the moment we launched that newspaper, mm -hmm. an assembly was called to call me out. Um, and that newspaper was not successful at the end of the day. But I had, you know, growing up, I was a very reserved person. And, but I had my first encounter uh, with activism to say, you can actually respond uh, to this. Um, fast forward in 2005, I became a magistrate um, in Blawayo at uh, Treadgold Magistrate's Court. Later moved to uh, to Mpopoma. Um, How long were you a magistrate? Um, 2005 to 2008. Okay, three years. Two three, and a half to yeah. three years. Yeah. And in that in that space, um, you supposed to stand for justice, but you then realize there's institutionalized injustice. Um, for example, you know, when an accused person shows uh, signs of insanity, you're supposed to stop a trial according to the Mental Health Act um, and commit them for examination. 
But now our institutions of examination are not as comfortable as your class yet ever. They uh, reflect a detention center. So you are just like you're in prison. Um, so I had a number of episodes that told me that I love to work for justice, but I don't think um, I am doing that. I'm not taking anything away, Trevor, from very sincere uh, my colleagues, working my judicial men and women, officers, yeah. And I know a lot of them have continued to play their activism even through the law. We have received in this country some of the most progressive judgments from judges that I believe provide that activist role. Even in this tough environment. Even in yeah. this tough environment. Judicial capture, essentially. Yes. So I'm not taking yeah. anything away from those men of great honor. Mm -hmm. But for me, I didn't feel I was finding. Um, I, I wanted to be closer to the ground, yeah. to where the action is. I remember uh, when we did the, we we, we, we remember Operation Brambachi. Yeah. So we marched from Makokova to Brethren in Christ. I was a match street then, but I needed in to In Lobe or in, in the city, city center? Um, it's, I think it's in the city center. City center, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Just, okay. yeah. I was a match street then, um, but I found myself gathering um, with the colleagues that had been convened by Christian Alliance. And in the silence, I marched quietly. I can tell you, Trevor, I found so much fulfillment in that space. Um, fast forward in 2008, judicial officers went on strike protesting against poor working conditions and all those things. There was political interference with that action. And as others decided to go back to work, I said, I'm not going back there. So that's when I resigned from the Minister of Justice. Um, and in 2009, I joined the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum in a journey uh, of movement building, in the journey of activism that I found very, very satisfying. Mm. And when I look back today, it's almost 12 or so years later, I don't regret. I'm poor, but I don't regret. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good place to be in, isn't it? You're poor, but you are, you're, you, you've you got peace inside of you. Yes, yes. yes. Do, do you think there, were, there, are, there are many like you, magistrates and judges, who feel the way you feel? There are many. We still might not have an option to be able to walk away, but they yeah. feel the same way that you do. There are many. There are many. And, you know, my, my um, you know, um, the four values that we have for Zim rights, the first is community. And we are the biggest human rights community in the mm -hmm. country. And the second one is activism. And the message there is activism matters. Mm -hmm. And we try to say, you don't need to be in an NGO or in a movement like mine uh, to do activism. Mm. You can use activism in whatever space that you are in. Do you remember Dr. Mashumba? Yes. Dr. Mashumba is a pediatrician. During COVID-19, she walked in front of the cameras and cried. She said, we want to save the children. How can we do that when we don't have mm. medicine? So that's a perfect example of a medical practitioner who is playing an activist role. So activism isn't a negative thing of throwing no. stones. Activism is stepping forward mm. using the tools that you have mm. to cause positive change, mm. inspired by the care for your community. Mm. So there are many such activists. Yeah, for me, uh, Zikamai, activism is an engaged citizenship. That is correct. A caring citizenship. That is correct. A citizenship that exercises its constitutional right and responsibility to oversee yes. the government of the, of the day. Am, am I right? A patriotic yeah. citizen. Right. That is correct. We'll take a break, but before we do, um, when we come back, this report here, the 23 uh, report confronting threats, personal security and peace, um, I think it is, uh, which is a, a, a Zim rights report, says, and I read and I quote, we live in a country where the state has collapsed and in its place, the party rules through fear and intimidation.
That's what Jim Wright says. And I agree with that statement. I want to come, I want for us to come back after the break and delve deeper into that statement. So at home, don't go away. Join us on the other side as we engage with that very strong statement. It's the three pieces of law were made without the participation of parliament. Greetings, my name is Trevor Nube, host of In Conversation with Trevor, Zimbabwe's most engaging conversational show. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. We've brought before your screens change makers from arts, business and politics and from the region. Please join our growing community of viewers. Subscribe, like and share. Welcome back to our conversation with uh, Zikama Ibere, the National Director for the Zimbabwe Human Rights Association, Zim Rights. Um, Zikama, where, where were you born? Um, I was born in, in Kwekwe, in the Midlands uh, province. Um, but I grew up in Buhera. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm basically a rural boy. That's mm -hmm. where I did my... Which school did you go to primary in Buhera? So that's Berry Primary School. Berry Primary, primary School, school. right. Um, a very uh, small uh, village school. And then I went to uh, Nyashanu Secondary School. That's Form 1 to Form 4. Mm -hmm. And then for A-levels, I went to Gutu High School. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then from Gutu, you then went to Solusi. From Gutu, then I then went to Solusi. To study school. law. Um, so I'm actually a multidisciplinarian. Mm -hmm. um, so I did first Bachelor of Arts in History. Uh, which is why when I speak about uh, human rights, we always uh, go back to the uh, powers that shape uh, the inequality. Um, so that was my first degree of so solution. Uh, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Arts in, Arts history. in history. Then I then did um, uh, Bachelor of Laws with uh, University of South Africa. And then I then did a uh, master's in conflict transformation with the mm -hmm. University of Basel and mm -hmm. the Swiss Peace Academy. So these three qualifications for me, they shape my activism because mm -hmm. they put me at the intersection of the law and the society. Mm -hmm. Was that deliberate? Um, I say it's grace. <laughs> grace, it's yeah. Grace, really. Um, law would have been my first degree uh, if I had a choice. But you didn't uh, have a choice. What happened? At, at that time, you know, we didn't have as many law schools yeah, uh, yeah. as we had. And when I couldn't get into University of Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. I thought I should do a roundabout way. Uh, but initially starting with uh, another bachelor's degree. Well, when did you when did you, did you start sensing that there was an activist inside of you? Um, so Trevor, this is actually a very sad story. Hmm. So this was in, um, when I was... Uh, uh, in, 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 in secondary school, um, I witnessed, uh, you know, long story, I witnessed a violation um, of a young woman's rights um, by a member of staff. I revolted against that and spoke out. I think it was in Form 2 or Form 3. Mm -hmm. I revolted against it and I spoke out. But as a young person, I didn't have, you know, the restraint. So I did speak out publicly and in the process humiliated the member of staff. Wow. Um, this was on a closing day. And what then followed was um, retribution from the school. So I was physically whipped. Wow. I was uh, meant to do some uh, things that I thought were unfair. I was very very hurt by that. Uh, but I accepted the punishment and went through it. Punishment for doing the right thing? Yes, because the story doesn't really come out like that. You see? Because this is power at play. Um, and that cost me my, um, my A-level vacants at the place. So the reason why I then moved from Nyashanu uh, to, go to, uh, to, to go to high school is because the school then blacklisted me. Hmm. Um, but thank God, you know, for some good people out there, um, I, I was able to be accommodated by another school um, and went on to progress with my studies. But that was my first encounter with injustice, and that was my first response uh, to injustice. Mm. What did that teach you? What did that season of your life teach you? 
it taught me a lot in terms of, you know, children's rights. Um, I mentioned the Trevor, you know, I'm, I'm a rural boy. I didn't get the kind of career uh, guidance that a lot of my folks uh, would have gotten at the time. So when the school blacklists such a child who does not know where to go, it's possibly an attempt at my life. Um, and I've always treated it as an attempt mm. at my life. And I've learned, you know, we're still in those WhatsApp groups. And I've learned to say, we need to respect children's rights. Because I never spoke to anyone, Trevor. And they don't speak to anyone because they don't have a community that we have as adults. They don't have the tools to respond that we have as adults. A few weeks ago, the police unleashed police dogs on high school, high school kids yeah. at St. Faith. And we, we went there to try and find out what, what was happening. And I had to insist that we needed to be there because for me, it's, it's a very soft sport. Um, schools are, are, are places of learning and growth and care. Safe spaces is supposed to be. Violence is no place. No. Violence is no place. We said a story that you share about uh, how you found your acti activism. Where is the story uh, at, at the moment, the, the faith uh, school? Uh, wh what's the situation with that? the police yeah. um, letting dogs onto children? Yes, yeah, so the police have said, uh, so the, the kids have been treated. Um, uh, so it actually did happen. The police let loose their dogs. Yes, that happened. That happened. We got photos. We, I think we published them on our Facebook. We've got photos. Um, uh, so the police did let, so the, the kids got treated, so that's the good thing. Um, I think heads off to the school authorities who put aside politics and decided to respond as human beings and make sure that the kids get uh, medical treatment. The police also deployed an investigative unit to the school. I think our teams that was on the ground were able to see some of them. So they have issued a statement to say they are getting to the bottom of this matter. But we have gone on also to say that this is a multifaceted mm. issue. There are many stakeholders. So we hold the police to account because the Police Act does not allow them to do what they did. The, the, the Constitution of Zimbabwe does not allow them to do what they did. So we hold them to account and we uh, made a call immediately for the operationalization of the Independent Complaints Commission under Section 210, mm -hmm. which allows ordinary people to raise complaints against the security forces. As I mentioned, this is a power issue. Mm -hmm. um, and we have also called on the school uh, to put in place conflict resolution mechanisms, mm -hmm. um, review their grievance uh, mm -hmm. mechanisms to, to, to avoid a situation like this happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Hopefully we're going to see the issue being resolved and those that are responsible responsible held to account particularly within the the, poli the police force um you before you joined zim rights i mean you'd been a, a magistrate in Bulawayo. where else have you worked um so i left um when i left the bench i worked uh, briefly with uh, an organization called uh, uh, acpd mm -hmm. you know africa community publishing development right. trust remember that was the time of the pre-GNU, right. and there was a conversation around the new constitution. Mm. So ACPD asked me to, so I volunteered really, I was not working, to write the legal chapters of the People's Guide okay. to Constitutional Debate, which was used to facilitate uh, across the country. Mm. And then from there, as people prepared for the GNU, mm. there were fears in civil society that justice would be sacrificed for political expedience. Mm. So the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum started the Taking Transitional Justice to the People program. So they invited me um, to run the program for six to eight months. They allowed me to stay for 10 years. <laughs> wow. Until 2019. <laughs> right. I then left to join Zim Rights. Mm. And currently you are also chairman of the Zimbabwe Peace Project, isn't it? That is correct. And you've also uh, been associated with the Zimbabwe Election Support Network. Are you on the board? Zimbabwe. Um, not, not, not anymore. Not anymore. On, the, on the previous, on the previous board. board. Yeah. Before we broke, I, I had um, uh, gone to your report, uh, which uh, puts uh, in a very succinct, succinct manner the state of affairs as far as our 
human rights in Zimbabwe are concerned, and I'll, I'll go back and quote from that report, where you say uh, in this report that uh, we live in a country where the state has collapsed and its place, and in its place the party rules through fear and intimidation. That's a pretty sad state of affairs, which in a, in a way somewhat, I'm not rushing to make conclusions here, but the police behave the way that they do because this is the environment that we live in. Can, can you help us unpack that? Yeah, so Trevor, this is um, the tragedy of our country. Um, so I will, I, will, I, will, um, I will unpack it for you. Mm -hmm. I will unpack it for you. Um, so we have so far witnessed, and many lawyers would agree, a collapse of the two main arms of government. Um, let me speak first with um, the, the parliament. And this collapse didn't start with the recalls. It started way long back. During COVID-19, over 63 pieces of law were made without the participation of parliament. Now, that needs to sink. Absolutely. So this is a lawmaking body, not the, just the Chinese building. This is a lawmaking body whose primary mandate, according to the constitution, is to make laws for the good of the country. But the executive then goes on to decide it wants to make laws on its own. Um, so which is why when you read these days, you begin to hear a decree, a presidential decree, a presidential decree, and there has been a challenge around the use of presidential powers to make laws. And that signifies a collapse of parliament as an important arm of government. Um, move back, Constitution Amendment Bill number two did mm -hmm. take away. Can I, can I hold you there uh, on, on that? This is a deliberate mm -hmm. collapsing of yes. the legislature mm -hmm. so that the president rules by decree. Mm -hmm. Do you want to push back on that? So what you then have is what we have, you know, um, trying to find lighter words called an executive democracy, where the executive seems to have taken control of all the arms of government. So that actually describes it. Now, the other important arm of government is the judiciary. And in this report, we do speak a lot about the issue of the independence of the judiciary. Just to give you an example, so we say a party rules in its mm, place. Mm. Just to give you an example, before elections, there was a report which was not challenged that judges received around $400,000 each. Now, if th those are millions of dollars. And now you want to ask your question to say, why was that money not put in the Judicial Service Commission so that judges can have good working conditions, whether they're elections or not? But the reason why those funds come before the elections is because the judges must know who is paying them those amounts of money. I've spoken to colleagues who are in the property sector. Before the elections, you couldn't buy a house. The prices went up because the judges... We're buying. We're in the market. We're in the market. Now... Fast forward after elections, we're beginning to see the kind of disempowering judicial pronouncements that erode the voices of the millions and elevate the voices of a few elite politicians, ultimately finishing off the institution of parliament in Zimbabwe. Hmm. This is, that's just the example of, of what we found in this report. And remember, we found this before this issue escalated. And in, in, in normal language, this is what people call, you know, the conflation of party and state. Mm -hmm. And people are not apologetic. Remember, there's actually a video of the president saying, we are the Air Force. We are everything. You, you can't do my... You. So they, it's not denied. And they're not It's deliberate. It's being done deliberately. And they want the people to know. When the people know, it strikes fear. Because when we speak about a perpetual state of security, we're looking at four levels, a holistic approach to personal security. So we're looking at physical security. 
We are looking at economic security. We are looking at environmental security. And mm. all these matter. But when you then have a party that can tell you that we determine the air that you breathe, can you participate freely in the democratic processes? Mm. Zimbabwe is about to celebrate 44 years of independence. And with that state of affairs existing with people voting mm. with their stomachs and people wondering why they should still be alive after casting a vote mm. with about 64 of our election observers being displaced the evening that an election closes with people, a third of the voters turning up at a polling station and they are unable to find ballot papers and they've already been disenfranchised. Can these people say, Zimbabwe at 44, we are free? Mm. Mm. So that's what we are. Are you hopeful? Um, the struggle for human rights, um, Trevor, is as old as humankind. It is a fight um, for freedom. Um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen said something that is very uh, fundamental. He said freedom is not an heirloom. Once received, it does not continue to exist without effort like an old paint. But it is a life, and as life, it must be nourished, defended, and, pre and, and preserved mm -hmm. by each successive generation. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that when we speak, you know, especially to upcoming human rights defenders, that we are very honest to say this is a lifetime struggle, and every generation will have to repurchase its own freedom, which is why when we speak as Africans, we can go back to the struggle against slavery. We got back to the struggle against colonialism. And now we thought we have been able to defeat um, the colonialists. And again, we find ourselves in this. So this is a lifetime struggle. What is the hope? Mm. The hope is, Trevor, that there is always a movement. Without the work of human rights defenders, slavery would not have collapsed. Mm. Without the work of human rights defenders, Colonialism would not have ended. And the hope is these comrades that we really respect did this without the amazing tools that we have at our disposal today. So I wouldn't want to end this conversation with just a dark picture, but to mm. say there's power in each and every one of us. If they were able to organize against slavery without WhatsApp, without mm. internet, without money, and they were fighting against a trillion dollar economy, it means today we should be able to continue to fight for our human mm. rights. And we continue day in, day out to receive reports of success. As we speak today, we've got a community in Mola who were displaced during the construction of Karibadem, the mm -hmm. Matonga people. Mm -hmm. Can you believe it? Until 23 June 2023, the people whose ancestors paid the ultimate price for us to get electricity today did not have electricity. Wow. So we went there, had conversations with them and started a campaign. And today they are celebrating that small victory. And the message that I make is, no matter how small the communities we are organizing in, mm. it's like the miracle of the raindrop, as Chi Chi as of my favorite author says, that finds itself coming together into little streams, little streams pouring to form mighty rivers and the mighty rivers pouring into mighty oceans. So we've got small communities that are organizing in mm. different spaces, many times outside the eye of the media. But these people are making a difference. And it is our call as Zimurites to say, in a world where the people who violate human rights are armed with the power of the state, the military, the police, with billions of dollars, ordinary people have got only each other and they must find each other and build communities of resistance and there are no apologies for that. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. It leads me to your Valentine's Day campaign. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> which I absolutely love. And uh, you said um, the, the Bill of Rights is a love manifesto. Mm -hmm. And on Valentine's Day, which coincided with uh, Ash Day, uh, Zim rights uh, members throughout the country were distributing red roses uh, and reminding people of their rights. Do you want in a, in a couple of minutes to, to unpack that for us? 
Yes, yes. So that's section 25, if I'm not mistaken, of our constitution, which provides protection to the family. Um, so we had a very beautiful coincidence because every Wednesday, if you follow the Zoom rights platforms, we call it Rights Wednesday. Mm. So we celebrate, we conscientize people about a certain. So this day it coincided with Ash Wednesday, which is big day for most of the traditional churches, the Catholics, the Anglican, dust to dust, the fragility of life. Um, and then, of course, Valentine's Day. And then we looked at this within the context of Section 25, in which the Constitution creates an obligation for the state to protect the family. And we're asking ourselves, why? It's because the family space is the summit of human life. Exactly. But we have seen over the years it becoming a place of abuse. And a lot of communities are nursing victims from the family institution. It's not supposed to be like that. So we invited the communities to reflect on that. What are the deficits that the state is supposed to play? So our members throughout the country went into the streets with that message to say, as you celebrate Valentine's Day, can you remember that somebody's hurting because they didn't find love mm. in that space? And our constitution is the primary love manifesto because it charges us to live peacefully with each other. It was um, uh, one of my former lecturers, you know, uh, is late now, Johan Galtung, uh, the founder of uh, uh, the discipline of peace studies, who said, where you find conflicts, solve them. Mm. In other words, he's saying, prevent violence before it outbreaks. Mm. And a lot of families um, are full of victims. And it's very important that we step forward as human rights defenders and, 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 and use the moments that we have uh, to help care without forgetting that the state also mm. has got an obligation in that section to support fathers mothers and children who are in need of care. Absolutely. I'm not going to let you go before we discuss books. Um, people out there love the books that we read and we share. You are an author. Um, apart from cycling to work, you cycle to work, eh? Sometimes. Yeah, yes, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you it's not the safest thing to do. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> you have written a number of articles. Uh, you've written a book on uh, uh, leadership chapters in, in, in books. But I want you to share with us, at least the, the, the viewers that are watching, there, at least uh, three books that you want to recommend that they read. What did you bring with you? Yeah. So um, as an activist, Trevor, it's imperative. Um, that I recommend the long walk mm. to freedom. And I encourage this for every activist because it sets the foundation for our freedom belief system. Right. But it teaches me personally three things. One, resilience. Mm. 27 years in a prison and you come out still a fighter. That's resilience. But second to that, focus. Mm. But even never lost. No. The focus. But thirdly, leadership. Mm. It was Nelson Mandela who said, leadership is not positional, but behavioral. Mm. He spoke about leading from the behind. Yeah. Because he himself, many people may not have noticed, he became an icon when he was not the president of ANC. Absolutely. ANC had a president. But he led without having a position. So that's, that's a powerful. Point. That that's Very powerful. Important. I know it's a household book mm. for many people. Mm. Thank but you. I always Thank you. recommend. It. Thank you very much. Then second one. This book is limitless. Upgrade mm -hmm. your brain. Learn anything faster. Unlock your mm -hmm. exceptional mind. Mm -hmm. So this is Jim Quick mm -hmm. um, at his best. Really. Um, and what I take from this book, uh, Trevor, is the limitless model. Um, uh, so in the limitless model, um, which I, yeah, it's right here. Mm -hmm. What I take from this book, among many things, is the limitless model. So because Jim Quick tells us that we are limitless, but not in 
a way of just making us feel good, but he actually then presents a scientific formula to unlock your limitless. So the limitless model, mindset, motivation, method. If you find yourself crashing into a wall, he says, search in those three areas. There is one thing that may be limited. Beautiful. And I'll be getting this book, definitely. And the no. last one? Um, I will not speak about this one, Trevor, mm -hmm. but okay. I will speak about... Uh, your third book. To, what is your third one? To, mm. The third book, although this one is your favorite. So okay. The third book that I want to share with So this you. is uh, Ma... This is Makinga. Makinga by uh, Chi Chia. Chi Chiazo. Chiazo. Yes. Okay, a fable about a journey to, to the South. A powerful African author. Mm -hmm. um, I picked up this book thinking that I'm just going to be, uh, you know, moving time. But before you know it, it reflected deeply on the pilgrimage of life. Mm. So it's a good book. Mm. But for your viewers, Trevor. Yeah, which one? My which third one, one yeah. on the list is a book called New Power. Mm -hmm. uh, by uh, uh, Jeremy Tins and, and Haynes. This book um, helped me when I was starting my position at Zim Rights because this book helps us understand power in the new world. And it breaks it down in a way that I think is very important for community organizers and activists. So it basically juxt justifies, juxtaposes mm. old power models and new power models. For example, old power model, there is a war. Mm -hmm. It's just tax. Yeah. New power model, the river. Mm. It flows. Old power model, um, money, currency. You hold the power by holding it yeah. to yourself. New power model, currency, electricity. Mm. You become powerful by channeling it, by That's sharing powerful. it. And it comes in the form of you know, the struggle for human rights, the struggle for human rights is a struggle for small people. And the question is, where do they find mm. their power? So I mentioned they don't have the power of the military. They don't have the power of the money. They find power in each other. Mm. And the new power helps us understand how we can generate power in new ways. So those are the three books. That's, that's powerful. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. You are deep, hey? Thank you. You are deep. And I think uh, we, we all need to watch you. You are going to go places. Uh, I think Zimbabwe needs principled, authentic activists like you to help the grassroots know their rights, embrace their rights, use their rights as much as possible. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you for the support. Trevor. Thank you. Thank you. Allow me now to turn to our viewers who are all over the, the world to say thank you for watching us. Remember, we are a weekly show. We are out on YouTube every Monday at 7 a.m. Central African time. And to ensure that you don't miss out on any of the quality conversations, such as one I've had with my brother, Zikamai here, I invite you to subscribe and then like and then share. Uh, with as many as people as possible. Um, we view your comments below each episode and we take your suggestions as to who should be coming onto the show. We have podcasts that sit on our website. So visit our website for all the podcasts for the episodes that have appeared. Thank you for your support. Until next time, cheers to you all.